So I guess what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and jump in. And uh, then by uh, when I when I get done with my part of the presentation, there'll be plenty of time for uh, Q and A. Um, so let's just jump into the slides here. So the title here is uh, the transgender exigency: the role of media representation. Uh, that's partially a riff on a book I have coming out that is also titled the transgender exigency. So the first question you might have is, why am I using that word? Exigency. Well, I like it. And I think it's accurate because an exigency is a situation marked by an urgent need. And uh, I describe the current situation as one that because uh, attitudes, practices, and laws are changing rapidly, particularly in the 2010s. Uh, and there is an increasingly, at times, vehement um, clash between uh, opposing viewpoints. And I literally believe that lives are in the balance. Um, and I, I think that uh, that's one of the things I'll talk about during the talk is the um, threats of, of uh, threats and reality of violence towards the transgender community. So I think we are in an urgent situation where we need to think about uh, the issues that I try to address in the book. Much of what you'll hear tonight is drawn from one chapter in particular that focuses on um, uh, the rise of visibility in various forms of, of media, particularly in the 2010s. So uh, I do want to make it clear that uh, the scope of my comments today, uh, in terms of what I mean by media, I will delineate exactly what I mean by that in a little bit. Um, but there is a broader view, if you're interested, here's, uh, there's a recent issue of the International Journal of Communication, which is an online journal that you can uh, access for free. Uh, there's a discussion by TJ Billard and others that take a much broader view of uh, the media landscape in terms of transgender issues. And you can see the title there, Rethinking and Retheorizing Transgender Media Representation. So I want to give a, a quick shout out to that, uh, that um, roundtable discussion. So um, the first point that I want to make is that uh, visibility, trans visibility is pretty much at an all time high. And um, I can say that in part because I'm old. And I remember the decades of coverage of different kinds of issues, uh, social movement issues, including those dealing with uh, LGB issues before we get got to an increased visibility of the T. So for example, um, uh, in 2012, then Vice President Joe Biden uh, was quoted calling transgender equality the civil rights issue of the time. He has said that again since that time. Uh, the 2015 State of the Union address was the first time in history where a US president uh, uttered the word transgender in public. And uh, as a more recent Barometer in 2020, literally a record number of openly transgender candidates uh, ran for political office. And when Joe Biden was elected, uh, literally the first day in office, uh, he signed a number of executive orders that, that dealt with um, transgender issues. So visibility is an all time high. However, visibility does not equal acceptance. I'm going to dive into that. Uh, for uh, part of tonight's presentation. Uh, the main point that I want to make for the next few minutes in document with various empirical evidence that's available is that there is still substantial prejudice against trans people in the US. Uh, it may be obvious, but it needs to be laid out in a scholarly manner. I don't use the word transphobia. I, I remember uh, in the 80s and 90s, when we uh, advocates moved away from uh, homophobia and tried to use more precise terminology, including simply prejudice. Uh, Gregory Herrick, who's one of the foremost psychologists uh, who um, has done a, a good deal of research on public attitudes towards the LGBT community, uh, also calls this sexual prejudice rather than uh, reducing it to uh, euphobia, which in some cases is not particularly accurate. Uh, trans prejudice is a term that I've heard that I, I, uh, I like. Um, so one of the earliest studies, in fact, was by uh, Herrick and Norton, 
Uh, and the data was actually collected in 2005, even though it wasn't published in 2000, until 2012. It was a, a survey of 2,281 uh, heterosexuals, so pretty good size uh, in there for that study. And they found some things that I think are, are, are noteworthy. One of the things that they found was that the attitudes towards uh, transgender people correlate with uh, attitudes towards gay men and lesbians. As you can see, the correlation here is between 0.66 and 0.84. Um, that's not 0.99, however. There is some di differentiation going on. The other thing that um, Norton and Herrick point out is that uh, the attitudes are less favorable towards transgender people as a category than they are towards gay men and towards lesbians. So the measure that they used of that, Herrick has developed a number of different scales, but then for this particular study, uh, what they used is, is a fairly straightforward and easy to use tool called a feeling thermometer. And this is particularly good for short phone interviews where you, where you say on a thermometer where 100 is the high, 50 is lukewarm, kind of take it or leave it, and zero is uh, as cold as you can get. Uh, how would you describe your feeling towards this group? And I'm going to show you a uh, chart on that in just a minute. But for transgender people, uh, women responded with a 36.2, which is, again, substantially below lukewarm. So that's a chilly reaction. And it's even lower, uh, 27.63 for, um, for men. So, uh, you know, this data is now 16 years uh, old. And we do know that there are changes happening in terms of attitudes towards transgender people. But it is uh, one of the more thorough studies uh, and therefore one that I think still informs the landscape, the political landscape that we're in right now. So here is a chart from that study. And um, I'll just walk you through it a little bit. That top line uh, was what I just described, the, the thermometer score for women and men towards transgender people. You will notice right below it are, is the category men in general. And notice that women scored men more warmly than men did, right? Women scored men at 65.71. Men scored men at 59.03. So we're talking even in the most favorable categories here on this whole chart, you know, we're, we're in, uh, it's not the exact same as temperature, but you know, we're, we're, we're not in high heat of 80s and 90s here. Uh, and uh, you can see the score for women in general is, is comparable, actually, uh, with both groups around 67. And then you can also see the scores for gay men uh, and uh, lesbian women and bisexual men and women. So it drops down, but the, the lowest group on this particular chart is in fact uh, transgender people. At the very bottom, by the way, uh, you'll see two abbreviations there, ATG and ATL. Uh, what that refers to are two instruments that uh, Herrick has developed. One is called the attitude towards gay men, uh, and the other one is the attitudes towards lesbians. And uh, you know, it is a, a um, uh, I, I can't tell you what these particular scores mean because I have to go back and take a look at the article, um, but, but that's, those are uh, frequently used measures of attitudes. And in fact, in some of the research that I'll talk about later that my colleagues back in Minnesota and I did uh, with respect to media representations of, of gay men, we use the ATG instrument to uh, assess those attitudes. Okay, uh, slightly more recent surveys, 2011, 2013. It's interesting, this top statistic here that was uh, found in 2011 is that less than 10% of people said that they know someone who is transgender. Uh, that's significant for two reasons. One is, as we will see, uh, that means that stereotypes and media coverage are more likely to influence people who do not have direct real world contact with a social group. The other is that we're gonna see that that number has climbed substantially in the last decade. Uh, there's still an acknowledgement in these studies that uh, significant discrimination, discrimination exists. The HRC survey from 2011 also used the feeling thermometer. Uh, they report the data in the pie chart there at the bottom. 
if you add cool with, with not particularly warm or cool, you'll see that that's over 60%, you know, about two, uh, almost uh, 75%. Um, and uh, so still pretty um, unsupportive attitudes when asked in, in this particular form. Now, despite this, this uh, uh, the existence of this prejudice and relatively tepid scores towards the category of transgender people, in the last uh, 20 years, and particularly the last 10 years, there's been remarkable success in many jurisdictions in securing legal rights uh, against discrimination. And there's a book that I wanted to share with you here by uh, Taylor Lewis and Hayter Markle called The Remarkable Rise of Transgender Rights. And you know, they're, they're quite clear in that is that this is a really rapid and remarkable uh, rise that in some ways uh, bootstraps on the uh, gay rights movements and the successes of the gay rights movements, which arguably culminated in the Supreme Court uh, validating same-sex marriage not that many years ago. And so uh, what we, we know is that, that attitudes towards LGB is not the same as attitudes towards T, but as I noted earlier, they are correlated. So there is some uh, related effects here. Uh, now, one of the things that's particularly interesting is that if you ask people straight up, should discrimination against transgender people be legal, most people will say no. So this the particular prompt in this study was transgender people deserve the same rights and protections as other Americans. 67%, two thirds, completely agree. And it goes up to 89% if you add the next group, which is mostly agree. That's really strong support. And you'll see that you know, even in the, the lower categories here, Republicans, 54% agreed, 32% mostly agreed. That's 86% combined. Uh, and similarly with the Midwest, those are the two uh, lowest scores. Um, but even those, uh, if you combine the completely with mostly agree, you'll find strong agreement with the, the notion that transgender people deserve the same rights and protections. However, uh, that is in part because they are being asked the question in more broad terms. When you push more specific issues, that support drops dramatically. Or for another example that they, that they talk about uh, is, you know, they uh, will support general uh, rights, but then if you ask them, will you support a trans transgender candidate for office, again, support, um, drops dramatically. Now, there are various predictors, uh, as you may have seen in uh, that earlier, uh, some of that earlier data. But one of the, uh, in fact, let me just go back to that for a moment, to see if I can, yeah, I, I think I actually uh, skipped over this uh, chart accidentally. These are some of the correlates uh, of attitudes towards um, transgender people. And so the column that's important here is the one under number one. This is what correlates with uh, attitudes towards transgender people. So the, the ones with asterisks are statistically significant, okay? The ones without asterisks means that it was not statistically significant. So you'll see, if you look basically from seven down through 11, political conservatism means more prejudice or cooler, uh, cooler temp, right? Uh, Anti-egalitarianism, which is sort of similar to authoritarianism, I might add. Rel religiosity, gender binary beliefs, 0.29, right? So, you know, you can, a lot of people today understand gender binary well enough to say, do you, do you favor gender binaries or do you think we should be breaking them down? And a significant number of people still strongly believe and support the uh, gender bin binary, including by the way, some transgender people. Um, and, but what we find is, is that that correlates not as strong as religion does, um, but it's the second strongest factor on this list in terms of predicting negative attitudes towards 
uh, transgender uh, groups. Okay, and uh, the strongest factor there at the very bottom is that ATG score that I talked about earlier, meaning that if a person has negative attitudes towards gay men in particular, they are more likely to have negative attitudes towards transgender people in general. Okay. All right. So, all right. So one of those, as you recall, uh, was this belief in the gender binary. And one way to describe that is belief in what is commonly described as biological essentialism. Biological essentialism or biological determinism uh, are terms that refer to the belief that sex determines gender, that, and that's genetic, right? So if you believe that, you know, and, and again, to throw in the religiosity part, you know, God made boys and girls, gave them this genetic code, and that's what makes them naturally feminine and masculine. That's a belief in biological essentialism. That, of course, is a belief that feminists have been battling um, since <clears throat> the late 60s, early 70s. Um, Sandra Bem has a wonderful book called The Lenses of Gender. She identifies three core beliefs that inform sexism, and this is number one, the belief in biological essentialism. Um, similarly, studies that uh, find that if, if people are supportive of what we call gender traditionalism, that also correlates with anti-trans prejudice. You know, there's, a, there's literally a beer commercial that says men should act like men. Um, and that's an example of gender traditionalism um, being reinforced, right? A couple studies here that support that. Uh, I'm happy to share these slides, by the way, with anybody who wants a PDF of them later. Uh, and I can also pr provide citations. I'm hoping that I provide you with enough that you could look it up yourself, but if you want fuller citations, happy to provide uh, any of those. So let's talk more about the media now and the media's role. Uh, first thing I wanna recommend if you have access to it is a documentary uh, that's available on Netflix called Disclosure. And if you remember the celluloid closet from uh, a while ago that gave a narrative about uh, how uh, gays and lesbians were, just, were portrayed in popular media, particular fiction, this is sort of the updated version of that applied specifically to transgender issues. Um, and um, I think they do a, a, a good job with it. I wanna point out a few examples from the early 90s uh, that again, I'm old enough to remember pretty vividly when these uh, came out. Upper left hand, well, actually I start with the lower left hand corner. This is a uh, highly talked about scene from the crying game where uh, the protagonist is uh, about to uh, make love with a character named Dill, who uh, in this moment in the film, uh, Fergus realizes has a penis and is a, a trans woman uh, and responds by punching Dill and then running to the bathroom and vomiting. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner is the comedy Soap Dish. Uh, uh, the Villain of the movie is the one yelling no, no, no here. Uh, and what's happening is on a live broadcast of the uh, soap opera, uh, characters come out and reveal from a yearbook that in fact she's a transsexual, as the terminology was at the time. And this is apparently such a humiliating revelation that she goes uh, running off stage and is plot-wise, you know, defeated in the movie. And then in the upper left-hand corner uh, is uh, Jim Carrey in uh, Ace Ventura, the pet, uh, pet detective. And this is the big reveal scene where again, a uh, female character is, is revealed uh, to be transgender. Uh, and it is, um, uh, it actually uh, parodies uh, the crying game a little bit because one reaction that some people have to the revelation is that they throw up. And again, you know, these portrayals are examples of, uh, you know, pretty negative portrayals that uh, were 
most people kind of went with the flow in the early 90s. And these, uh, these movies, all three of them were uh, successful in their, own, in their own right. And the point that I want to make here is, if you put these things together, is prejudice is really bad. We're not just talking about people saying rude things. Uh, we're talking about real consequences here. And uh, I want to share some of that, that data with you. So the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network reports that 75% of transgender students feel unsafe at school because of their gender expression. And in the most comprehensive gathering of data, the US Transgender Survey in 2015, uh, that transgender students indicated 54% being verbally harassed, 24% physically attacked, 13% sexually assaulted. Those are pretty uh, unfortunate statistics. There is a um, uh, meta-analysis in a sense, kind of actually a meta-literature review done by Zach Marshall in 2019 uh, that found that between 2010 and 2014, uh, looking just at studies at transgender, non-binary and gender diverse individuals that there were 99 studies or articles exploring discrimination and marginalization of transgender people, 47, another 47 documenting violence and trauma. So a very well-documented uh, phenomenon. Uh, in a survey of uh, just from last June 2020, 1,500 self-identified uh, members of the LGBTQ community, 62% of transgender Americans reported facing discrimination of some kind in the past year, that would have been 2021. Two-thirds report that that discrimination moderately or significantly affected their psychological well-being, with roughly half reporting moderate to significant physical impacts as well. So there's a lot of prejudice and the media has played a role in that. Well, let's, let's unpack that uh, a bit more. But before I get to that, uh, one last slide here. In 2019, again, you know, less than two years ago, both the Human Rights Coalition and the arguably nonpartisan American Medical Association described violence against transgender people as an epidemic. And it's not all stranger violence. There's a lot of documentation on partner violence uh, against transgender people as well. Uh, in this particular study by the Williams Institute at UCLA uh, found that as many as 50% experienced that. The violence continues. This is a headline from May, 2021. The US hits record for transgender killings. Uh, and there are actually not one, but two Wikipedia pages uh, that are devoted to trying to keep up with documenting uh, these uh, uh, unfortunate killings. Um, okay, so there's a problem here and the media plays a role. And that's what I wanna talk about, two ways in which the media plays a role. The first is through the way the news frames issues. T.J. Billard, who I mentioned a little bit earlier, did a study in 2016 where he analyzed a number of different dimensions of language used in media coverage and argued that there are certain kinds of language that are very delegitimizing for the trans community. Uh, you know, misgendering would be an obvious example. And that that kind of language can detrimentally impact both the pro uh, projected legitimacy of transgender claims particularly political claims, and in general, public perceptions of the transgender community. So how stories are framed that involve transgender people can play a uh, attitude influencing role. Uh, Barry Tadlock, political scientist, did a study that covered um, over you know, about 20 years worth of news coverage. He looked primarily at these newspapers uh, that are, are uh, some regional, but mostly you know, you know, nationally read newspapers, um, and found some interesting things. Uh, most articles about transgender people were highly individualistic about this transgender person or that transgender person. And uh, that is processed by people very differently. Um, and that's different than a systemic or a you know, policy-oriented kinds of orientation. In fact, systemic 
orientation only occurred in 1.7% of the articles that Tadlock um, looked at. Uh, the dominant frames that Tadlock found were things like education, which means educating the reader about transgender issues, equality claims, liberty claims, safety and security, which sometimes refer to the safety and security of transgender people, sometimes the safety and security fears of people of transgender people. Pathology is, as it sounds, a, a, a negative frame that describes transgender uh, people as you know, having a pathological issue. Tadlock found in about half of the study, studies uh, or articles that should say analyze, there's actually a pretty evident positive or negative perspective being proposed about half the time. And of those 29 articles, 10 of the 29 uh, were explicitly negative and anti uh, transgender rights. So the media uh, framing plays a role. Now, you recall that Tadlock's analysis ended in 2011. I think it would be uh, a good research project to update that analysis. Um, and if anybody's interested in, in working with me on that, I, otherwise I, I do know of some potential collaborators across the river. Um, anecdotally, I tend to notice in the last year or so, two sort of, um, uh, frames that, again, I've noticed, I can't claim empirically that they're dominant, but one is uh, framing that, that clearly makes it uh, a statement that there are policy proposals that are attacks on transgender people. And this one from CNN from uh, April of this year, it says this record-breaking year for anti-transgender legislation would affect minors the most. So, you know, that positions transgender people as, in this case, you know, uh, victims of, of policy assault, if you will. Um, the, the alternative framing that I think is also uh, pretty common, this is, this is one from uh, television, is uh, the more typical uh, pseudo-neutral frame of it's a battle right, the battle over transgender rights, in which case the uh, news author is ostensibly not on either side, but is reporting that there's a battle that kind of, and that kind of framing, of course, equalizes matters and normalizes uh, the, the conflict. So my working hypothesis that I'd like to explore empirically is whether or not those, in fact, are predominant uh, frames or, or not. We also know, this is an interesting study that, that came out uh, this year, um, that framing impacts transgender people as audience members as well. And here you see the headline for yourself. This is in a journal called LGBT uh, Health. Negative transgender uh, related media message are, messages are associated with adverse mental health outcomes in a multi-state study of transgender adults. In fact, in some instances, that kind of reaction was described as uh, like post-traumatic stress because the coverage uh, forced some viewers to kind of relive prejudice or uh, attacks that they had to experience themselves in the past. The other uh, way that media can influence attitudes that potentially I think is more positive uh, is through entertainment media. There's a great deal of research, some of which I'm going to talk about here, uh, that indicates that media representation really does matter. It's not only the, if you can see it, you can be it coverage, which I think is also important, but it can also actually decrease prejudice towards specific social groups. And remember that statistic I said earlier, where only 10% said they know somebody who's transgender. We know from the research that I'm about to describe that the, the entertainment media's effect is the biggest with those people who don't have real world contact with those groups. So I, to, to get us there, I want to quickly recall what's known as the contact hypothesis that dates back to the 1950s. It's most often credited, although I don't think he actually originated it, but he certainly popularized it, Gordon Alport. Um, and he believed and argues in his, his 1954 very, very influential book on prejudice uh, 
The prejudice is fueled by ignorance that we don't know a social group and therefore we reduce them to the stereotypes that we've heard about them that are frequently false and negative. So Alport helped to popularize the contact hypothesis that says contact facilitates learning about a social group. And if you, the more you learn about a group and recognize how diverse they are and, and that you know, the stereotypes are wrong and overgeneralized, then the more you can reduce prejudice. Uh, now, there's been six decades, almost, almost seven, seven decades of research on the contact hypothesis. It has been supported by literally hundreds of studies. The last meta-analysis I saw, I think had over 600 studies uh, that have supported the contact hypothesis. But in the process of articulating it, there are certain conditions that need to be met for contact, contact to have a beneficial uh, prejudice reducing effect. There needs to be a perception of equal status. That's why in the deep South, blacks and whites had a lot of contact, uh, but until the civil rights legislation established equal, uh, more equal rights, uh, you know, Jim Crow laws were still essentially reinforcing uh, the prejudicial attitudes that many Southerners um, had. Uh, it helps to have common goals. It helps to have situations where there can be intergroup cooperation. Importantly, this next one deserves sort of an extra star. Uh, it needs to not be opposed by authorities and the law, which again explains why in the South, uh, it took major legislation to begin to break down the level of prejudice. And, and there of course needs to be sufficient contact, both quantity and, and quality wise, uh, to uh, permit people to learn about a groups and for their prejudice to be reduced. Uh, a movie that really nicely illustrates what I'm talking about here is a movie called Remember the Titans, which is actually based on a true story in Virginia, uh, where they, uh, the first year they integrated the football team and both sides start off very distrustful of the other, uh, and particularly the white students were, you know, obviously in the in majority uh, group and were many of whom were, were pretty racist. Um, but the coaches eventually work together and they create that situation where there was a they, black and white players had to room together at camp. They had to learn about each other. They had to report something that they learned about their their uh, roommate. And then, of course, they had the common goals of success in the game. And by the end of the movie, uh, the, the two featured uh, characters, one white, white, one black, had become essentially best friends. And of course the team was very, very successful. But what I like about it in particular, uh, other than it's based on a true story, um, is that it, it really does illustrate the contact hypothesis and the various conditions involved with it being met. Uh, yeah, as I just said, they, they, it met these various conditions. Now, uh, what happened in about 2005 uh, is the development of uh, something that my colleagues and I called the parasocial contact hypothesis. Parasocial simply refers to the fact that the contact is not face-to-face, -face, but is mediated. And there's already a body of literature going back to the 50s that talked about parasocial interaction and parasocial relationships. Uh, Horton and Wool uh, termed that phrase back in 1956. So what we did was we basically smushed together uh, the notion of parasocial interaction with the contact hypothesis and did a series of, of I think we did a total of five or six studies uh, that found that people can learn through that parasocial contact in ways that are analogous to the contact hypothesis, face-to-face -face learning experiences, and it can reduce prejudice. So um, five of those studies were published in, I guess it was five studies, uh, communication monographs. The 2005 article was simply titled The Parasocial Contact Hypothesis. Uh, in the Journal of Homosexuality, we published a study specifically on the TV show Will and Grace. Uh, and in my book, Beyond Representational Correctness, uh, I talk about a film class that I taught 
that uh, we found that watching certain films decreased prejudice towards sexual minorities. Uh, the studies or the shows in the uh, communication monographs article included Six Feet Under and the original iteration of the show Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, which was a great uh, stimuli, set of stimuli, because there are five different gay guys on the show. So there was a lot of opportunity for viewers who might not know any gay uh, men in real life to learn a lot about that category. And this research was actually um, the first empirical research that documented that prejudice could be reduced towards sexual minorities. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the parasocial contact hypothesis. And again, I wanna emphasize that the, so the amount of change depended on prior contact. So if you had a person who already had two or three gay friends, their attitudes were not changed all that much, if at all. But it was that group that had little to no real world contact and therefore you know, didn't know much about other than stereotypes. Uh, that is the group where we saw the most dramatic decrease uh, of prejudice. And I love this quote from Gordon Alpert, uh, a differentiated category is the opposite of a stereotype. So when you learn that members of a particular social group are actually quite varied, uh, it is a, a key cognitive step into breaking down that prejudice. We actually also included a study, I forgot this one. This was on uh, about Eddie Izzard, uh, who is a actor and stand-up comic. And Eddie in uh, those days uh, referred to themself uh, as a transvestite. And in a stand-up routine that we had people view, uh, Eddie differentiated between weirdo transvestites and executive transvestites. And he does this whole thing about it being a broader community. That's category work that is exactly the kind of benefit that contact help provides. Uh, our research has been out there for a while now. It's been replicated by scholars literally uh, all over the world working on mediated contact between a wide variety of majority and minority populations. So as an empirical proposition, it's, it's, uh, it's in pretty good shape. So what does that have to do with transgender issues? This is um, Jazz Jennings, if you don't recognize her in this photo. Well, again, you know, I had a, a picture on the very first slide of uh, the, when Time Magazine declared uh, a transgender moment. Uh, we had increased visibility, particularly in 2015. You had things like uh, Orange is the New Black with uh, Laverne uh, Cox uh, featured in it. She was on the cover of that Time Magazine article I had earlier. Transparent uh, was um, hitting the airwaves and had several seasons. Diane Sawyer uh, had her interview with soon to be Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, and there were three new reality shows uh, that all featured transgender lead characters. I Am Kate about Caitlyn Jenner. I Am Jazz about Jazz Jennings, which had six seasons uh, and Becoming Us. That was a, a one season reality show. And uh, I am actually not going to, to show this film clip in the interest of time. Um, and, uh, but this was uh, a, an article about uh, Jenner's interview with Diane Sawyer. Uh, which was actually right before Jenner came out as Caitlin, but it was announcing the intention to transition. And that created quite a media moment uh, that is uh, been studied. We're going to turn next up. Oh, nope, there we go. Uh, later that same year is when the, the famous Vanity Fair um, issue came out, Call Me Caitlin. And what there's very interesting research uh, that specifically is about the impact Caitlyn Jenner had in particular. So uh, Lee, in a 2018 study, found that news framing of transgender issues improved after that 2020 interview. By improved, I mean things like less misgendering and uh, more sympathetic framing of transgender issues. A uh, study by Patrick Miller and colleagues uh, and there was a, a, an unpublished version in 2019 and a published version in 2020, both of which provide empirical support that particularly among older viewers who remember Jenner, uh, 
uh, as an Olympic athlete in 1976, and I confess that I'm in that group that remembers that, uh, found that that group in particular, older viewers who generally are more conservative in their attitudes on, on uh, issues of sexual minorities, uh, that Jenner's story was meaningful and uh, prompted a more uh, empathetic response. They found that exposure to the Jenner, Jenner story predicted reduced prejudice and quote, following the Jenner story itself as a form of parasocial contact may have caused ameliorated attitudes towards transgender people and rights, okay? So that story by itself was quite noteworthy in uh, 2015. Uh, there were other shows, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of these documentaries and, and of course, uh, neo, or, uh, reality shows rather. Um, and uh, one of the things that Lee notes in a 2021 article is that the depiction of the, of the transition itself, the psychological shifts and coping mechanisms of transgendering with transgender loved ones guide outgroup members, that is to say cisgender uh, viewers, um, through the process of learning what transgender identity is, how to live with it, and unlearning gender uh, hegemony. So very much consistent with what the parasocial contact hypothesis would say. You learn about the group by uh, seeing transgender people portrayed. And this works, by the way, regardless of whether it is reality or fictive television. Uh, fictional narratives also have this, this um, can have this prejudice reducing effect. Uh, a couple others that I'm gonna run through fairly quickly in the interest of time here. Uh, if there, there's a YouTube channel, Nikki Tutorial, who is a, a makeup, um, makeup and fashion, primarily makeup, I think. Uh, I, I'm not an expert, but she came out as transgender um, about a year ago, I want to say. Uh, and that view has been viewed over 37 million times. Uh, and there is another study that I cite in the book that looks at YouTube content and talks about how important YouTube content is for uh, transgender youth in particular to connect with others. Uh, there's a study of 400 viewers of an episode of Royal Pains, which is a uh, dramedy um, that is not ostensibly about transgender issues. It's a, a medical dramedy, but there was an episode where a transgender uh, character was central and they found that even a single episode uh, with a relatively brief storyline can inf be influential for decreasing prejudice. And that was a study that was published in 2018. Visibility and representation of transgender uh, people and TV is up. You see two examples here of Nicole Maines and Supergirl, who she is transgender and she plays a transgender character. And on Grey's Anatomy, I don't know, I don't watch the show, but, but this character was on there for a while. I don't know if, if he's still on there, but Alex Blue Davis, again, a transgender uh, man playing a transgender man. So representation uh, is increasing. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, visibility can be a double-edged sword. On one hand, we do know that prayer social contact has the potential to decrease president, uh, prejudice. On the other hand, remember those conditions that Alport's uh, subsequent research, though all the hundreds of studies that were done on the contact hypothesis demonstrated. Opposition from a salient authority can mute or moot the impact uh, or some or all of the impact of positive parasocial contact if it is opposed by a salient authority figure. So, and we just had four years of that, right? We had uh, pretty pro, the emergence of pro-transgender issues in the, in the, at the end of the Obama administration in particular, um, you know, and that came under a crushing uh, halt under the Trump administration. Uh, and we now find uh, various you know, Republican politicians uh, taking pretty anti-trans positions. That matters. A study just published in 2020 here by Jones and Brewer, uh, basing the, they're doing a, a study of data from 2015-16, found that uh, politically aware citizens tend to follow their elite cues along ide ideological lines. 
In other words, it matters if the head of the Republican Party takes an anti-trans position and the head of the Democratic Party takes a pro-trans position. That is a, it doesn't have to be translated that way, but the fact is uh, that it, it is. It is for many people. And that's why they conclude that the future trajectory of public opinion on transgender rights would thus seem to depend significantly on the behavior of elites, okay? Uh, and in general, uh, yeah. So in, I'm gonna have to look at the chat stuff when I get done, but I promise I will do that at that point. So in general, what's happened with transgender issues is that they've become the latest front in the so-called uh, culture wars. There's a recent, uh, just last week, uh, uh, column by Judith Butler in The Guardian, uh, where she describes what she believes is a worldwide effort to quash LGBTQ in general, with transgender issues being sort of the, the wedge issue, if you will. And she says the attacks on so-called gender ideology have grown throughout the world, uh, stoked by electronic networks and backed by extensive right-wing Catholic and evangelical organizations. And we might add in the US, uh, in many places, the Republican Party. And her point is, is that, you know, even though these efforts may be, uh, in, in terms of their leadership, nationalistic, transphobic, misogynist, uh, and homophobic, the aim, they believe, is to reverse progressive legislation that has been won over a period of decades, uh, decades of progress um, by the feminist movement and LGBTQI uh, issues. And there's a, a link to uh, her article from last week in The Guardian, but you can find it pretty easily uh, by looking at that date, October 23rd. So it's definitely uh, been activated. I'll give you a couple of quick examples. There have been efforts in some states to deny medical care for transgender minors, particularly uh, puberty blocking uh, or hormone therapy drugs. Uh, the red states are states that are, have either passed it or are considering passing it. Uh, another example is um, dealing with uh, bathrooms in particular. Uh, you'll see that North Carolina is no longer red. It was actually one of the first states that passed such a law, but there was so much backlash to it that they largely uh, have backed off of that with the election of a Democratic governor. Uh, but you can see there are some states that are green. That means that they actually have passed legislation uh, to protect transgender peoples um, from being discriminated against for bathroom access. And some of those laws have actually been on the books for years and years now. So we actually have a lot of empirical data uh, showing that there's no harm done. Uh, and but we do still have some conservative states there that are uh, considering or passing. There's actually a number of states where this has been proposed, but relatively few where it has passed so far. Sports is a particular uh, hot spot. There have been, I think, you know, 10 states now that have passed laws that, be, that in public schools that forbid, um, they're primarily aimed at transgender girls competing with, on the girls teams. Uh, you can see these are all sort of recognizable as uh, fairly conservative states. Uh, South Dakota was a state where the governor actually uh, vetoed the law, but then did very similar things through executive action. Uh, Texas Governor Abbott just signed that, that law this in this uh, uh, past week. There are other states, including Massachusetts and um, Connecticut, that have the opposite kind of laws that specifically protect uh, students' uh, access to sporting teams uh, based on gender identity. So it's definitely a flashpoint going on right now. Uh, and that's what essentially led to this book. Uh, the Transgender Exigency, Defining Sex and Gender in the 21st Century. Uh, this is the book that I, I started on uh, as in my pandemic. Actually, I started it before the pandemic, but basically uh, have written over the last uh, two years. It's going to be out in uh, December. Uh, what I've talked about today in terms of media is mostly uh, stemming from chapter three of that book. What the rest of the book uh, looks at are these controversies over how sex and gender should be defined in contexts specifically that have been traditionally segregated by sex slash gender, including single sex schools, bathrooms, the military, sports, 
and prisons. Obviously, I don't have time to uh, talk about those um, tonight, um, but those are uh, that's what makes up the bulk of the of the book. Um, and so, what I try to do in those uh, case study chapters is understand the history of sex segregation in a particular context because they have very different historical roots, uh, and thereby try to identify what are the values and interests that competing definitions represent. And in some cases, uh, the value is plain misogyny or um, uh, sexism and, and, or, uh, uh, or trans prejudice in the case of the military. Uh, and so that's what I try to do is unpack in each chapter uh, what the values are that underlie competing, the competing definitions in there. So I, I'm going to skip over this. This was going to I was going to talk a little bit about the bathroom chapter, but since it's already six, I'm going to I'm not going to do that. Um, but what happened in that case, just as you can see here, is that the bathroom, you know, the the ordinance that simply said don't you can't discriminate against people uh, based on gender identity turned into oh this is a law that's going to let men use women's bathrooms, and that's a threat. And that was what the whole campaign was that ultimately ended up reversing that Houston City Council ordinance. And I'm not gonna show you the ad. Uh, on the other hand, this is one of my favorite uh, visual arguments on the other side. Uh, this is Michael Hughes on the right, a trans man. And when uh, this was all hitting uh, the, the airwaves a few years ago, he had a series of photos like of this, of himself in women's bathrooms. These are friends of his that are, uh, helping him make the photograph to show how absurd it would be to require uh, him to use the women's restroom. Uh, as I said, the battle, particularly in bathroom bills, is uh, far from over. It, it turns out that the latest surveys are indicating that a growing number of people are actually supporting restricting bathroom access. I think that goes back to the fact that those they're getting their cues from certain political elites with whom they want mm -hmm. to identify. And uh, this is a headline from just September 29th, uh, you know, few, um, about a month ago. Uh, most Americans generally support pro-LGBTQ policies, as I documented earlier, but are getting increasingly divided over specifics such as transgender sports and bathroom policies. And that's uh, a study that was recently released by the Public Religion Research Institute. There's their link if you wanna take a look at the study as a whole. We do know, by the way, I just want to say uh, that the empirical evidence makes it very clear that there is no threat in these bathrooms. There are jurisdictions that have had um, bathroom bills on the books for years with no problems. On the other hand, we do know that there are substantial psychological and physical harms uh, that are imposed on transgender people when bathrooms uh, bills are passed. And that includes everything from increasing rates of uh, UTI from people having to hold it too long uh, to uh, physical violence and increased suicidal ideation as documented by Seelman's study in 2016. So a pretty clear call in terms of what the relative harms of the two definitions are there. There's a wide range of what I call regulatory definitions, that is definitions that regulate who counts as male or female, man or woman in any particular context. They range from single sex colleges that only require, like Wellesley, only require you to say, I'm going to live my life as a woman to be eligible to apply for admission. Uh, others want a matching birth certificate. So even in single sex colleges, there's the variety. Sports is another example. I gave you, there are 10 states that now have a biological essentialist definition of sex, where there, there are a fewer number of states, on the other hand, that allow self-identification as the means of defining uh, gender for sports participation. Same is true with jails and prisons. There are states that require that you, you go to the jail that your birth certificate says you belong in, and uh, California, Massachusetts, um, and there's at least one other state, are uh, trying to empower self-definition for being a, uh, a presumptive not necessarily final, but presumptive means of assigning uh, whether you go to the a, a men's or women's facility. So 
to cut to the conclusion of the book, uh, basically, I argue that, look, the more onerous a definitional criteria with, you know, the surgery being the highest demanding uh, criteria, which the Olympics require, if you want to compete in a, a sport uh, outside your uh, assigned birth uh, sex, uh, with self-identification being the, the least restrictive, that the more you move up that, that ladder, the more compelling and powerful the rationale uh, needs to be. Um, the book, is a, as I said, is coming out actually in December 17th. I want to give a shout out right here to MIT Libraries, thanks to a, a generous grant from them. The book will be available open access. So uh, if you don't want to buy it, you don't have to. You can download it. I believe it will be like a PDF that you'll be able to download. Uh, and that'll be on December 17th and maybe, maybe sooner, but probably December 17th. I've also referenced a couple of times in this book, uh, the other books and articles that I've done that are relevant to this talk on the parasocial contact hypothesis. The previous book I did on, on pragmatic approaches to definitions is called Defining Reality. Uh, I have all of this in PDF form. And if anybody uh, would like a copy, I'm more than happy to uh, share that with them. And there is my email address, just my last name at mit.edu. And you can see some of my uh, early gender socialization going on there with the way my parents dressed me on the left-hand side there. So uh, I'm going to finally end it there, a little bit longer than I meant to be. Um, and going to, to turn it over to whatever questions we have time for in the remaining minutes of the, of the talk. Thank you, Ed. Um, this is Heather. I'm, oops, I'm in the dark. Um, hi, I apologize for missing the very beginning. I had an unstable internet signal and everything went to hell in a handbasket, but I'm on my hotspot on my phone now, so I should be fine. Um, I, I wanted to uh, make two very, very quick uh, comments and, and ask uh, two questions just to kick us off. Um, for the comments, I just wanted to say, especially for some of the uh, younger folks out there uh, watching this talk, um, that this this argument about um, uh, the dangers of, of of different sexes being in bathrooms uh, goes back to the ERA, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. And we were talking about Phyllis Schlafly in my grad class uh, just the other day. And so I just wanted to like fill people in that like this as a kind of crisis uh, rhetoric um, has, has a history going back, um, I would say to, to at least the seventies. And I, it's just fascinating how it just sticks. Can as, I interrupt as, you for just two yeah, seconds? Sure. Cause I have a bathroom related comment. Yes. So if you've ever used the restrooms in building 14N, right, where CMSW headquarters are, yeah. uh, the women's room on the third floor is much nicer than the men's room. And there's an interesting sexist history behind that because laws requiring bathrooms to be separated by sex are actually not all that old. They actually only emerged in the late 1800s. And a lot of the rationale for having separate bathrooms was based on this idea, not only of privacy, but of protecting women. Yeah. And that's why a lot of women's rooms are, um, almost, uh, they're, sometimes they're called lounges even, that there's a, be an extra couch in there, things of that sort. Uh, and not every place, of course, but in, in, in many places. And that actually has its historical roots in this sort of uh, differential treatment between uh, of the sexes with, uh, with bathrooms. Yeah, that's an interesting point that these spaces for women are treated as kind of aesthetic spaces in some ways, a place to fix your makeup and that they're treated as utilitarian spaces um, when they're uh, targeted to men. Um, so yeah, thank you for filling us in on that. Um, my other comment was about, uh, just quickly about Caitlyn Jenner, that she is a, you know, a very uh, aggressively a pro-Trump supporter. And so it's just, a, it's a ideologically sort of incoherent to me and speaks to um, some of the complications of what you're saying about the importance of authorities um, and how that influences attitudes. Um, my questions were first about, um, Disclosure, which I will watch. I'm very glad you drew our attention to that. Um, and I'm a I'm a, a 
I've, I've seen the cellular closet several times and I also recommend that to those who haven't seen it. Um, and one of the most fascinating things about the cellular closet is that the focus is really on, on uh, interviewing people who wrote for Hollywood uh, in the 50s and 60s and maybe the 70s, but it's really that, that earlier era. And you get to see people behind the scenes talking about you know, something that seemed like a reading against the grain when you saw the film. And they're like, oh no, we totally meant that to be about gay people. Or yeah, camp is not a, you know, a, a hidden thing. It's what we were doing because we wanted to express ourselves and so on. So it's the behind the scenes stuff in that film is really fascinating. And I'm wondering if if Disclosure um, gets into that at all, or if you've just thought about the role of trans uh, people as producers, um, as opposed to just uh, on the representation side of the equation. And my other question was also about, uh, rep is more about representation and just if you've thought about or seen any studies about trans people appearing uh, in media or in television, say, um, where it's not an issue, it's not a very special issue about trans, but just, you know, you have a trans actor, like say in the, in the, in the Queen's Gambit where it's not discussed, it's just sort of there. And this of course was a tactic for African-Americans uh, in particular in the sixties of just sort of casually incorporating African-Americans into cast and not making it an issue that had to be discussed. Um, so those are my two questions. All right. And also, so, I didn't say this, but thank you very much for your talk. I should have opened okay, with that. Sure. Let me address those questions in reverse order so I don't forget the second one. Uh, for a representation to have the possibility of decreasing prejudice, the viewer must recognize that that person represents that group. So even if it's not, it, you know, it could, to answer your question, it could have a positive effect as long as the viewer recognizes, oh, that's, that's a trans woman or that's a trans man. But if, if it's not called attention to in the narrative of the show, then it depends on how savvy the viewer is, right? Um, so, you know, the, they do have, on the other hand with African-Americans, uh, you know, or, or, or certain other groups. And again, people are not, not necessarily fine grained, right? Then what I mean by that is uh, most people are not, this is, there's a long history here of Japanese people portraying Chinese people and, and you know, but they get grouped under Asian, which means Asian representation tends to end up being um, a more holistic set of attitudes. So at any way, uh, yes, I think actually the more normalized it is to have trans people in a narrative, the better, but it won't reduce prejudice unless viewers recognize them as trans. And then to go back to the point about disclosure, particularly with celluloid uh, closet, disclosure, I think, uh, I think they learned some lessons about celluloid closet. And what I mean by that is it ends on a more upbeat note that I recall celluloid closet uh, ending, um, which is, you know, I mean, the basic narrative is here's all these horrible, horrible, horrible representations, uh, you know, which is not a shock. Um, and, but devoting a non trivial amount of time towards the end of the documentary, documentary noting progress uh, in some of the, with some of the shows that I've talked about before. And the issue, uh, I believe, of trans writers being in the writing room is also, I think that's also talked about, if, if my memory is correct. I, I know I certainly am aware of that discussion being uh, taking place, but so I hope I answered your questions. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, let's, let's open up. Um, we could go to, um, we have a few things actually in the chat if we want to take a look at that. Um, or um, actually maybe we have an actual um, question fully fleshed out in, in the Q&A here. Thanks for a great talk, Ed. This is from Tom uh, Scahill. Scahill. Uh, your examples supporting the parasocial contact hypothesis involve visual representations. Do you know of any studies that, that discuss the efficacy of non-visual media written and maybe even strictly audio media such as podcasts for parasocial contact changing attitudes towards trans people? And hi, Tom, first of all. Secondly, yes, as a matter of fact, I've got the cards. Um, and uh, I, I don't have the sites memorized, but I, they are cited in my uh, chapter three of my book. And I'd be happy to, to, to look up those sites. But they included uh, like short stories, 
Um, and obviously the portrayal has to be not negative, right? You can't have a, a, a trans character who's the villain and expect it to change attitudes in a positive way. Uh, but sympathetic portrayals and even relatively short vignettes, you know, like a few paragraphs about my experience as a trans person found. And again, when we talk about changing prejudice, you know, I want to make it real clear. It doesn't mean real like that. It's not necessarily a 180 degree turn, but that's OK, because what the research on prejudice reduction shows is, is that you do work by stages. And if you can get the foot in the door and get people away from a highly negative attitude, then they're more likely to actually maybe interact with a transgender person in real life. Boom, you move the, the dial a bit further. Or they'll watch a show uh, that you know it has transgender characters. Boom, a little bit further. And so these things can can build on each other. But it really is interesting. I haven't heard anything, have any research about podcasts. But I would think that the logic would be the same. If you are learning about a category of, of people with whom you do not have real world face to face contact, yes, mediated contact. If you learn about the group and it's a, you know, positive representation. Uh, can reduce prejudice. The way we operationalized positive representations in our studies was we had a, a series of, of measures that we did ab about how people felt about straight characters, the, the main straight characters, as well as the main uh, gay characters. And we wanted to make sure that people were, were not seeing them substantially um, inferior, negative to those. It's interesting what you say about um, negative characters, because, of course, negative characters uh, can be written such that they are incredibly appealing. Um, so, you know, I, I would just wonder if it's a kind of victory uh, for a, a, a subjugated group when they when having a negative character from that group is no longer problematic in the way it was earlier. I was thinking of like Giancarlo Esposito in uh, uh, The Mandalorian, right? He's a villain and he is probably, you know, one of the very best characters on the show. But if that character, that type of character in the 60s would have seen been seen as, you know, very problematic, perhaps com compared to now. Um, do we have anyone else who is uh, live um, on our Zoom or not live, but, you know, whose face we can see um, who would like to kick in and say something, ask something? I see Sulafa has her hand up. Ah, Sulafa, you'll need to unmute. Oh, yeah. hello. Um, um, thank you for your talk. A uh, really interesting topic. I actually have a follow-up about the parasocial relationship. And I'm mainly thinking about like how uh, many of us now practice binge watching a show rather than like watching once a week. And um, I haven't really studied parasocial relationships, but my hunch tells me that that might form like a different type of relationship to a character where we binge an entire season in a day or two rather than like wait weekly to meet with them. Uh, do, you, do you think that that might have a different effect or have, have there even been studies about that? I think, there's, I think there's actually been one study on that and I, I have to do a little digging to find it. Um, uh, not so much that the study was on, it was not necessarily about prejudice reduction, but it was about the kind of parasocial relationship that you might have with characters. We do know, for example, that when that people um, respond, psychologically speaking, similarly to the loss of a beloved character uh, in, in not unfamiliar ways as they would lose when they lose somebody in real life, there's, there's grief involved. Uh, and, and there are, you know, I, I miss that character uh, kind of reactions. And uh, I do, I either, I think I re maybe reviewed a study, I don't know if it's in print yet, but I think I reviewed a study that was trying to address this very issue about you know, periodic uh, experience of a show versus binge, watch, binge watching. And uh, I, I think that it's the periodic watching that builds sort of grows deeper roots. Uh, I mean, you binge watch, you, it's like uh, the difference between um, getting drenched in a drip, drip, drip effect over time. Drip, drip, drip is actually, will have a bigger long-term impact because uh, it, you'll remember it. And memory is where these reactions live. Whereas binge watching, uh, you know, 
whether those attitudes that are encouraged by, by spending a couple of days deeply invested, will those last over time? You know, depends how much you like it. If you go back and re-binge, uh, you know, which some of us have done during the pandemic, re-watched a series we've already seen, you know, that's a good way to dig the, the roots in deeper as well. So I hope that answers your question. As I said, I know I read a study on that. I might have been a reviewer at the time. So I'll have to check to see if I can figure that out. Thanks, Ed. Um, we have a, a question in the Q&A from Carl. How do you think about, excuse me, how do you think about or account for the backlash effect of increased visibility? Yeah, um, there's a couple of people who I, I, I cite on that who, who first drew my attention to the notion that it's a double-edged sword because there are, of course, many uh, trans people who just want to live their lives and they just want to pass and they don't want the attention. Um, and the kind of the more you make these issues salient, then the greater the risk that somebody's going to notice or somebody's going to bring it up. Um, and as I commented earlier, the visibility uh, has led to this being a politicized issue now. And that politicized issue uh, is fueling trans prejudice. And so it's, it's sort of uh, a double-edged sword. Now, I think in the long run, uh, you need the visibility, right? You need to normalize transgender characters in fictional TV, for example, or, fiction, or in movies. Um, but the ability of those kinds of representations to reduce prejudice are going to be less pronounced uh, in a period where political elites that you might affiliate with. I mean, Tucker Carlson I wouldn't take advice Tucker Carlson offered on anything, but he's got millions of people who do, and the guy is anti-trans, and that's going to influence viewers. So I see Amber has a, has a question, so let's go to her. Yeah, thank you, Ed, uh, for your talk. It's fantastic. I have a question. Uh, do you have a sense about how reception or prejudice uh, might change if we add the issue of like race and class? to trans people uh, in, in media representation? Absolutely, and thank you for, for raising that. I do address the issue of intersectionality in the book. Uh, I did not do so much, obviously I didn't mention those terms today. Uh, yeah, I mean, the most vulnerable group and the group that is victimized and the most violence against uh, are black trans women. That is the group uh, that are, for lack of a better way of putting it, murdered the most of all trans of all trans groups, um, and that's because within certain cultures they're they're violating the norms uh, that are expected by some who believe in those gender binaries, um, and so uh, again I think that um, that's why you know. In, in the book, Beyond Representational Correctness, one of the points that I make is that there's no such thing as a perfect representation. There's no such thing. There is also no single representation that's going to solve a, a problem of prejudice. So the solution is more and more and more and diversity. And so if you wanna reduce prejudice towards trans uh, people, then you need to have trans men as well as trans women and you need to have, uh, you know, Hispanic trans women, tr Hispanic trans men, uh, and you need to have, uh, you know, again, the full spectrum because it is intersectional. Uh, there's a, a HBO show called We're Here that uh, if you have not watched, I encourage you to to try to catch it if you get a chance to. Uh, it's aired on HBO, and then you if you miss episodes, you have to go to HBO Max to to view it, which I'm not real fond of, but. Um, and it's mostly about, uh, um, it's, a, it's a show about three drag queens who go to, bless their heart, you know, conservative rural areas and put on a drag show and take three people who uh, are in the LGBTQ community there uh, who participate in, in, in some cases, and they're very dramatic stories. Some of those stories are transgender stories. Uh, and they are also pretty diverse stories because of where they travel. The episode that I just recently watched, they were in Del Rio, Texas. So there was a, a, a 
added dimensionality of uh, people who live on the border and who have Hispanic background and Latina background and Latino background. So uh, that's a, I don't know if I've answered your question. It is, it is an important added dimension, absolutely. Um, and I do discuss it some in um, the book. Um, and I have a chapter actually on uh, how feminism is wrestling with issues of transgenderism. And that's a place in particular where I, I uh, do a quick call back on the history of uh, the rise of intersectionality as a important topic in, in feminist theorizing in particular. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? I'll look at the chat says, uh, uh, from Narbal, brilliant professor, always pretty good to listen to you and your reflections. I would love to hear you talking about the possible connection between PCH and human rights. Greetings from Brazil. Hi, Narbal. Nice to see you, uh, or nice to hear from you. Um, yeah, so the Part of the problem of answering this is, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna limit myself to narrative media programming. That is to say, whether it be reality or fictional, they're both narratives. And that means they have recognizable characters. And what television and film are good at is evoking an emotional response between viewers and characters. Again, whether those characters be fictive or real not so good with more abstract philosophical concepts like human rights. So what that means is, is that you could get sympathy for a group of people that may be related to the fact that their rights have been denied. You betcha, you betcha, it can do that. But what we found was, is we did, we did a, a, one of the research projects we did we wanted to see if, if a class devoted to masculinity changed anybody's attitudes about masculinity. And in particular, how they saw themselves, whether they're biologically considered male or female on birth or not, whether their attitudes about their own gender norms was, was changed. No, people did not get into the abstractions, nor were they willing necessarily to change uh, how they would describe themselves. What it did do, though, is it, gained, it, it elicited a sympathetic response with the characters that they saw. So it reduced prejudice against gay men, against transgender men in this. We had a film that featured that um, against drag queens. So they had a sympathetic response with the characters. But that doesn't necessarily translate to, to broader political uh, abstractions. I wish it did. I wish it did. It's hard to do systemic critique through narrative media. Well, we've just about hit 6.30, but do we have one last question before we um, sign off? By the way, thank, thank you, Narble, for, for joining us. Professor from Brazil, great guy. Well, that's great. Um, okay, well, I think we will stop there then. Thank you again, Professor Schiappa, for your talk. We really appreciate it. You betcha. And I'm putting my email address one last time in the chat box for those who are um, on Zoom. Otherwise, it's just my last name, S-C-H-I-A-P-P-A -P -P -A at MIT.edu. So if there are any sources that I've described here uh, uh, that you would like more information about, any of the publications that I've, I've discussed, uh, just reach out. And we will also have a recording of this available shortly. So if anyone wants to revisit any of the slides or the um, citations, you can also do it that way. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. You.